The policy of social distancing will be needed until at least the end of the year. And any thought of a return to normal in the short term is totally unrealistic. That's the forthright warning from the government's chief medical advisor, who explained that there was only an incredibly small chance of a vaccine or treatments being ready for use this year. He spoke as the latest figures were released, showing 763 deaths were recorded in hospital across the UK in the last 24-hour period. That brings the official total so far to more than 18,000 people, without counting deaths in care homes and the community in England and Northern Ireland. So we start tonight with our science editor, David Shukman. We've been warned repeatedly of a long haul, that the momentous restrictions to try to contain the virus cannot be lifted soon. And now we're learning more about what that really means. Everything hinges on a massive research effort to try to develop vaccines, to create immunity, and also drugs to manage the disease. And at the moment, we don't have either. So at today's government briefing, the chief medical officer for England said that social distancing would have to continue while we wait for those vaccines and treatments. Until we have those, and the probability of having those any time in the next calendar year are incredibly small, and I think we should be realistic about that, mm. we're going to have to rely on other social measures, which of course are very socially disruptive, as everyone is, is finding at the moment. But until that point, that is what we will have to do, and it will have to be the, the, the best combination uh, that maximises uh, the outlooks. But it's going to take a long time, and I think we need to be aware of that. Professor Whitty pointed to this graph to show that even though the rate of deaths is falling in Britain, and in other countries, it's a very slow process. This disease is not going to be eradicated. It is not going to disappear. So we have to accept that we are working with a disease that we are going to be with globally, this is a global problem, for the foreseeable future. If people are hoping that it's suddenly going to move from where we are now in lockdown suddenly into everything's gone, that is a wholly unrealistic expectation. We're going to have to do a lot of things for really quite a long period of time. The question is, what is the best package? And this is what we're trying to work out. What that means is learning to cope with the disease rather than trying to beat it. And mass testing is a vital step to doing that, to know who's got it and where it's spread. Using apps to track people's contacts will help work out how the virus is being transmitted so any future outbreaks can be isolated. For the moment, the scenario of quiet streets is set to continue and the challenge for the government is that every option for easing the restrictions carries the risk of a resurgence of the virus. So right now it's hard to see when, or indeed if, we'll get back to normal. For businesses, large and small, this means more anxious times. This chain of bars in Manchester has 600 staff, almost all of them now furloughed. It would be pretty disastrous. Uh, I, I think our restaurants, if we do open them, I think they will be barely profitable. And with our bars, I think it will be impossible to be profitable. The capacities of the bars and restaurants will be reduced so much by the social distancing measures that I think it will force us to be closed rather than open. I think we'll lose less money being closed than we will being open. And tonight among the public, we found disappointment, but also a sense of resignation. It's not nice, but we have to, to do it because otherwise the virus is going to be bad for the people, you know. I think we've got to do what we have to do. If you've got parents or grandparents, then frankly, you've got to keep them, you've got to look after them. It does seem a bit, a bit extreme, but if it's necessary, maybe we have to go that way. The struggle against the virus is exacting a very high price. Vaccines and treatments can't come soon enough, but no one can predict when we'll get them. David Shukman, BBC News. Let's go live to Westminster. Our political editor, Laura Kunzberg, is there. Well, Laura, people have been asking for clarity and openness in these briefings, and Professor Whitty certainly provided that today. 
Well, he did, Hugh, and it was striking him to, to hear him talk so plainly. But while it was striking, his answer was not necessarily that surprising. If you go back a month, government documents put together by their scientists said plainly in black and white the kind of measures we're seeing now could last those disruptions for 12 months or so. And remember, he's also not talking about everything staying exactly as it is right now, this status quo, this lockdown. And I think we still can expect in the coming weeks the government to come forward with some kinds of tweaks or promises of tweaks and ways of lifting some of the restrictions on and off. For now, though, in Westminster, ministers want to stay completely tight-lipped about what those changes might be because the data is evolving day by day and they don't want to raise expectation or indeed be overly pessimistic. And I don't think Downing Street, therefore, will be very perplexed by what Chris Whitty has said tonight. If anything, he's been valued by politicians for his ability to talk plainly to the public. What is worth noting, though, is tomorrow we'll hear from Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister in Scotland, who will publish her own framework of how Scotland thinks it might be able to move forward with tweaking or changing some of the restrictions. But just like politicians here, just like the Chief Medical Advisor for the whole of the UK, I would expect her to emphasise the message that whatever small changes there might be in the coming weeks, we're in this for the long haul. Laura, many thanks again. Laura Ginsburg there with the latest at Westminster. Well, the scale and impact of coronavirus in care homes across the UK is now becoming clearer. The Office for National Statistics and the Care Quality Commission will publish exact figures next week. But here's what we know so far. Uh, just over 1,000 residents had died in care homes in England and Wales up to the 10th of April. Uh, but in the five days after that, the regulator believes the total could have doubled, uh, up to 2,000 in England alone. The picture in Scotland is also clearer. It's been confirmed that a third of people who have so far died of COVID-19 passed away in care homes. Now, the relevant figures for Wales and Northern Ireland uh, are not yet available. Our social affairs correspondent, Alison Holt, has been looking at the figures. Care home by care home, we've been told of many lives lost in recent weeks from the Oaklands Nursing Home in Hove to Castle Troy in Luton and on to St Ives Lodge on the outskirts of London, where six residents have died, five from COVID-19. Official statistics have lagged behind the sad reality of those losses, but today's announcement suggesting the doubling of care home deaths in England underlines the pace of what's happened. At St Ives, they hope they have now managed to fight off the virus. At the moment, we've got no patients, no residents with COVID, and um, all our staff have been tested uh, uh, since last week. Um, we've still got a couple who are going to be tested um, over the next couple of days. Um, but it, it's, it's just really frightening, the numbers mounting up. The care regulator in England has altered the way it collects information about people who've died in residential and nursing homes. Since April the 10th, it's asked if the death is linked to confirmed or suspected coronavirus. Its preliminary findings suggest about a thousand people could have died in homes in five days. She was lovely, my mum. She was, um, she had the starts of dementia, but she wasn't severely disabled with that. Christine Mullen was moved from her care home to hospital where she died. Her death will be reflected in NHS figures. But for her family, like many others, the central question is whether vulnerable residents have been well enough protected. I think the elderly people, obviously, from the beginning, were said to be the most vulnerable cohort of, of people with this virus. And they should have been focused on immediately as the priority for prevention of, of, of spread of the virus and protection. In Scotland, it's estimated a third of COVID-related deaths are in care homes. The First Minister insists that is not inevitable. And in England, the government says it's doing all it can to protect people. In a virus that targets the, the elderly and the vulnerable, do you see that as inevitable? No, I don't think anything's inevitable. We're fighting uh, tooth and nail, striving every sinew to make sure we minimise the life lost in all contexts. Look, we're conscious that there's a challenge with care homes. I've said that um, in my earlier remarks, but we are doing everything we can. The situation is improving. We are getting uh, the PPE to those places that need it. 
Those care staff who are still struggling to get enough protective equipment and testing will want ongoing reassurance that those promises will be fulfilled. Alison Holt, BBC News.